All right, we're rolling. I'm back, video plenary session. I'm joined by the great Monica Gandhi. <laughs> Everyone loves to get your input, Monica. Thanks so much for doing this podcast Thank yet you. again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're on the media circuit. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you, you know, you've been one of the great voices of optimism. And one of the things you've been talking about lately is optimism towards ending or peeling back restrictions. I wonder if you might take people through, how do you think about this? When might we do that? And what are the triggers for it? Yes, I think this is a great question. And I'm really interested in talking about this because we've had a complicated relationship with restrictions, not actually because people are not don't think that COVID-19 is real or, or, you know, it was a hoax, but because it has severely caused lots of other things like collateral damage and children not being in school and other health problems. And so it is important to figure out, okay, what are the metrics of when we end restrictions? Restrictions being reduced capacity, um, masking uh, and distancing. And, and also have people back and in, into in-person. Mm -hmm. And I think that we there are actually very clear metrics that we can come up with okay. uh, on that. So for example, and this is just one example, it doesn't have to be this way, but I wrote with Ashish John Sierra Madad in a Washington Post op-ed about like this particular metric that we said, okay, end it all, end it all, mass and distancing when you're at five, hospitalizations over a hundred thousand people okay. and that why did we come up with that actually during influenza it's 20 to 40 um, uh, hospitalizations per hundred thousand hundred thousand so it's actually way less than that okay. but we really went back and forth on that and we said well two things one is that influenza in the hospital is not as deadly as COVID in the hospital more people go on to die from COVID in the hospital mm -hmm. if they get to the point of hospitalization mm -hmm. and the second was that these vaccines are so much more effective than flu mm -hmm. vaccines. Right. So we came up with this five. Right. And you know, California is at five, like any minute now. Any we minute were at now. six yeah. uh, per 100,000 hospitalizations um, yesterday. So, so we but could, I want, yeah, I think that's one, one idea. Well, no, that's a great idea. And one of the things that- And 40% vaccination rate though. I mean, of course it's in the setting of vaccination. So sure. it's like 40% first dose with that. And I said, I see. But the one thing I want to draw attention to what it isn't is it isn't about PCR positivity. Right. It is about um, bad outcomes from SARS-CoV-2. And 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 then the other thing to just point out is that the, the threshold of vaccination you propose, I think probably we're 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 past it. Uh, is we're that, past is it. Yeah. We're at 50 percent first dose in the United States, but that's not true everywhere. Okay. So we're at like 65 percent first dose in our city, San Francisco. Um, but 45.6% right now in, in Michigan. Okay. So it's varying all over and then that's an average. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, we said that because at the time we were hoping that 40 was that inflection point mm -hmm. when cases come down. Yes. I actually think that depends on the natural immunity of the population. Sure. The inflection point may be higher for places that don't have natural immunity. Sure. But at any rate, you'll know because why will you know that the hospitalizations have gone down so to that degree? Right. And you're right, it's not about PCR positive right. cases. I mean, that was always a flawed concept to use PCR for a test because it's so, so sensitive. I see. So oh, very low viral loads in the nose will amplify. And then if you get a qualitative answer, yes, no, it will look like it's yes, even when you have very low viral loads and you can't transmit it, which is why many of us for so long have been saying, either don't use PCR, use a rapid antigen test that gives you a a viral load that's more on par with infection. I see. Or if you're going to use PCR, tell us how many times the PCR machine had to spin. How many cycles? Yeah, and spin, and spike and cycles yeah. to get to to that number. Because if you cycle a lot, you have to spin 42 a lot. cycles. You're well, not, it's yeah, actually uh, probably more like yeah, 35. 35 is that like, it's infectious. Is where you're infectious. Right. But when, when you see some of these test results at 42 cycles, you don't know what that means. It, well, I do know what it means. I think it's so low in your virus that it in your nose that it's dead. Right, okay. It's essentially low in non-infectious viral right. load. But because of this yes, no question that you get on a report, yes, right. no, it looks like you have to isolate, looks like you have to quarantine. And that that is just a truism of the test. I see. And I guess if one were to stand back, you would say that the philosophical principle that you're gonna defend is this idea that at some point, combination of people have been vaccinated, combination of outcomes are looking good. We have to define that before we get there, agree on it and then get rid of the restrictions at that point yes and and the fact that that will exist just psychologically 
Yes. We'll make people better off. Motivating. Yes. It's motivating. motivating. Yeah. I just think it's so, because what has really freaked me out over the last week, mm -hmm. and maybe this, I'm hoping this is not right, but the seven day average of how many people want their vaccine is yes. going down. Okay. Um, meaning we actually have the supply, but people may not want it as much. And yesterday there was a focus group uh, that was reported on the Washington Post and people were saying, I'm not getting it because they said I'm gonna need boosters forever. I'm gonna need uh, like saw that. this yes. and this and this. I saw that. And I'm so worried that people are not motivated by the fact that this opens the door to Wonderland and you get out of the restrictions if you take, you know, if we can get the vaccine uptake. I saw that focus group and they pointed to um, several things that they felt like you know, who do we have to appeal to? And I think we have to separate what is appealing to those of us who've rushed to get vaccinated and what is appealing to this person who might still be on the fence. And they're different people. Yeah. And um, and this pointed out that you, the more you talk about a yearly booster, the less enthused I am about getting the first one. Yeah, because, that was really important. Yeah. And, and I think there's some truth to that because, um, you know, um, if one were to make a graph of the, the, the benefit, the vast majority of the benefits of the first, the first dose, and then a little bit more for the second dose to complete the series. Yeah. And then any yearly booster theoretically may have some small benefit. We don't know for sure because we have no data. Yeah, I don't um, think we're gonna need them. I think long, immunity is gonna be longer lasting than we think this yes. is not influenza. And I guess the question will be, one question I've had is, what will the evidence be to justify the booster? And if somebody comes to you and say, you know, we can generate, if you get the booster, the antibody titer will be higher. Is that satisfactory to you? Or are you going to say, I want to show, show me that the booster means less hospitalizations, less uh, severe illness. What would you want to see in a booster? Yeah, I think this is a great question. So I was thinking about this in the context of the question, should we be doing mass asymptomatic testing after yes. vaccination? And my answer to that, along with many, would be no. And, and along with the CDC, actually, because by telling us that we don't have to quarantine, um, when we're exposed as vaccinated individuals, that's saying that you don't have to test if you're exposed. Um, and our surveillance testing in this country is going to be if you're hospitalized with COVID, then we'll be genotyping and doing surveillance. So I was thinking about this in the context of the UK, who was doing a lot of mass asymptomatic testing after vaccination. And what they're revealing is in a nursing home, for example, someone by a PCR test has a low viral load, you get a yes, no answer, it looks like they got COVID. Mm -hmm. Then they actually sequenced it up and they found 200 cases of the India double mutant, mm -hmm. which we can talk about, yes, and, and like 100 what? cases of yes. the uh, B1351. And um, that doesn't, I actually think that means the vaccine's working. Right. It means that your IgA swooped into your nose, you, you got the viral load really low, you can't transmit it. And if you just do a PCR test, as what we just talked about, it's going to look like it's positive. And then suddenly that poor older person in a nursing home is quarantined, is put over here, is isolated, can't see their family, India double mutant. And um, I'm very worried about mass asymptomatic testing after vaccination, as opposed to doing the right thing, which is test anyone who's unvaccinated. Sure. If symptomatic or, uh, symptomatic or asymptomatic, if they've been exposed, which is what we do now. And of course, test anyone who's symptomatic after sure. vaccination also test them for RSV and influenza and other things that we're going to be doing routinely sure. in the future. And then if you see that a particular variant has somehow magically evolved our immune system, uh, out of all our immune system, then you have to watch out, confirm, see what that variant is, sequence it, figure out what we should do with the vaccines and give a booster. Um, so that's how I think we can be monitoring when we need this. Like next winter, you and I, when we're working in the hospital, we're going to, if someone comes in with a respiratory illness, we're going to swab them for uh, RSV, for um, for influenza, for COVID, for lots of things. And then the influenza person goes this way. Yes. Tamiflu, the uh, COVID person goes this way, around desperate and storage. We, we, will like, we will always look for it. And then if there's, um, if we can see a concerning pattern, we'll need to boost. Okay. And that's a, that's a great answer. Vaccines and kids. I read a really interesting article in Undark Magazine by Sarah Talpos. You're quoted. Um, what are your thoughts? Are we going to, um, I guess there's two, I mean, the two questions for you is what might actually happen or shake out? And then the next question is, what, what, what do we need? You know, what are we looking for? Do we, do we have to do it? So I agree with your position that this has been a infection that affects older vulnerable and also with comorbidities people. And what I'm 
Now, all I can think about right now is global vaccine equity. And all I can think about is India. Um, I had an aunt who just died this morning, oh, no, um, so actually from COVID in India. And it's my, my father's sister, last oh, no. remaining sister. So I am very freaked out about India and very freaked out about places in the world where older people are dying of COVID, which um, when we have these wonderful vaccines. And I'm very interested in global vaccine equity, getting our vaccines over there, figuring out what we should be doing with patents so that pharmaceutical companies still get a profit motive, but that for um, poorer countries that they can release the patent and allow um, countries to make those vaccines on site. And I signed something that we sent to the NIH this, just this morning um, that was featured in Financial Times where a lot of HIV researchers signed this to say, Dr. Fauci, let's figure out what to do with the Moderna patent um, about um, other countries. So that said, um, so let yeah. yeah. You say that because these issues are intertwined because as supply is manufactured, yes. you can choose uh, the, the children in high income nations or older people globally. Right. And they are intertwined. So I would rather older people globally get it because we're as safe as global people are right. and children are safe, more safe from the um, from SARS-CoV-2 as they always have been. It's right. just spared children, the severe outcomes. It's just a epidemiologic truism fact. Okay. So then let's, if we stop saying that we need to help the rest of the world to, um, even selfishly to help ourselves if we just take that out of the equation, do we need to vaccinate children to get to herd immunity was the question in that article. And I don't think so. Um, I don't actually think so because of just pure math. It's just mm -hmm. simple math. Um, uh, is that paper in, in Israel really moved me um, and it was important to me that for every 20 point increase, yes. vaccinating adults have halved the risk of infection in children. Yes. Um, and that so that, that was very interesting. So that meant by definition, these vaccines reduce transmission. So the more you vaccinate adults, children can't even be exposed right. to the virus. Um, so they won't become vectors for adults. So it's very important to think that we want to get to herd immunity. And uh, those 11 and younger in our in our nation period are 14.5% are of the population. So 86.5% of us, if we could get vaccinated, right. that's way above the threshold I think right. we're going to get to to herd immunity. So I don't think we need to vaccinate those children. I'm all for vaccines. If children, if parents want to vaccinate their children, sure. they should. The data is going to come out. They they should. But there are five diseases the CDC can mandate vaccinations uh -huh. for: their measles, mumps, rubella, pertussis, and diphtheria. Uh -huh. Why? Because they're diseases that make children very ill. And so that's what the CDC, <laughs> CDC can't actually mandate: human papillomavirus vaccine in schools, like they can the ones that cause children to be ill. I so I don't know what how the ethics is going to shake out. Yes. Can we mandate vaccines for young children? I don't know either. And I guess what would make me uncomfortable is if someone were to argue that one of the reasons we ought to mandate it in kids is to protect people, adults, who choose not to be vaccinated. That, to me, introduces kind of a, a quandary. Um, because we want the adults to want to be vaccinated. We want the adults yeah, to get right. vaccinated because it's offered to them. Yes. On the other hand, this this has happened in the past. Yeah. Actually, there have been children once the H flu, uh, uh, Mophilus influenza decreased in children that they were still vaccinated to protect older people. Mm -hmm. So this ethical question is going to have to play out. But at this moment, um, what is clear to me that is that fall schools should be full in person. K through 12 learning without the concept of two to 11 year olds needing to be vaccinated That's a good point. when those are uh, vaccine trials are still ongoing and they're just for safety. Now, you know, there's been so much talk about variants and, and variant escape. And of course, all the talk happened the moment we just started the vaccination before that, that we spoke of variants, but now suddenly we're going to talk about them all the time. Okay, fair enough. Um, my question is, you know, um, I guess we should be clear about what vaccine escape means. And to me, it means that you have a strain so virulent that despite vaccination, people are getting really sick and dying almost at the same rates. If you have a strain that results in runny nose or cold-like symptoms, but nobody is dying, you know, I don't know what to call that, maybe uh, like vaccine, uh, uh, like, like you have a waterproof watch or a water-resistant watch, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's right, a good, it's, right, it's a like good it's, way to put it, yeah. It, it doesn't concern me as much. I guess my question is, and I was reading a little bit about some of the basic science here, is are there is there a constraint on how much the spike protein can mutate? Um, you know, is, the, is, is it constrained? Um, and, and do we know, I mean, 
can, can we put a number on the probability that this could occur? Um, it's something that's easy for people to bandy about. Uh, people love to bandy about things these days without putting probability on it. The, you know, the idea you'll get out COVID outside, there's a, you know, is there's a chance maybe, yeah. but is the chance got a lot of zeros in that decimal point, decimal point, a lot of zeros, sure. Um, so it's important to kind of put some sense on this. Do you have a sense of it or how do you think of it? I do, I do actually, I have an, I, uh, I do have an opinion about that. The reason is that I work with HIV. And so I know about the concept of fitness, yes. uh, that come fitness costs that comes with mutations. Yes. So the way I think about this is, um, HIV has a very what we call leaky polymerase. Yes, that terrible. it um, fidelity is horrible. Fidelity is horrible of its of its of of the of the reverse transcriptase, which is the name of its polymerase, and so it can mutate very readily, and um, that we saw super early on. So with AZT. Uh, it would mutate and then AZT wouldn't work. And then you needed double therapy and then it would mutate through double therapy, um, AZT and, uh, and DDI. And so, uh, and so then you actually needed triple therapy to hem it in and stop it from mutating. So you needed one um, therapy here, one therapy here, and one therapy here, hemmed it in and it can't mutate. Um, and uh, so that's why we use combination antiretroviral therapy for HIV. What we realized interestingly early on, because um, is that there's a fitness cost to the virus if it mutates. So it may be able to evade, in this case, lamivudine by developing what's called an M184V mutation, but it actually will not be able to replicate as fast. Mm -hmm. And the viral load in your body will be lower even naturally because there is a cost to everything you do. Like if we were mutating and we had a hand that came out of our head, um, there may be a cost to that because we couldn't wear a hat. Um, so, um, so really, it's true. And so, I think that um, that the thing of, to think about the spike protein of the coronavirus, um, SARS-CoV-2, is and the same thing happened with influenza is that it will be able to develop some some mutations along the surface. Maybe those will have an evolutionary advantage of sticking more to the. Um, receptors so that it can create higher viral loads and spread more readily, but it will not mutate forever and, and be a super pathogen that will evade our vaccines. And I don't believe that. And right. really um, the, the, the way I simply explain it to people is that now we have data that there's at least 52 epitopes, tiny little pieces of the spike protein where you develop an individual CD8 cell to as an oh, individual really? T cell okay. to. Okay. This was a paper by NIAD that Dr. Fauci talked about at the White House Task Force meeting now three weeks ago um, to this day. And this is a very important paper because there's 52 little pieces of the spike protein that CD8, different CD8 cells respond to. So if you um, mutate one little piece or you're even not, two little pieces, not gonna you have 51, sure. you have 50 epitopes left. So no, I don't think our teeth, it is, I mean, Dr. Vincent Raniacello is my, the guy who, if I have my virology book here in my day, yes. <laughs> this is my, I have Mandel, I have virology, and he wrote the textbook on virology, and he has messaged very strongly, he doesn't think these viruses will out-evolve these vaccines. It's an interesting point. I mean, you know, when we talk so much about um, the virus evolving, we kind of anthropomorphize the process. You know, we make it seem like the virus has some volition, but of course it doesn't. It has, it's blindly replicating. And what happens is you insert selection pressures into the system um, because the vaccine is highly effective. Yeah. And um, there may be some other uh, strains. I, I'm about to say clones because in my line of work, that's what it's yes. cancer clones, right? Yes. It's a similar process yes. um, that do get um, a preferential advantage. And it's an advantage they didn't have before because they may have been the, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of the weakest uh, and the bunch, but now all the other ones are being kind of suppressed. And so they have some sort of competitive advantage in this space. Um, but, you know, one can worry that the virus will actually become more effective, but the far more likely possibility is it's less effective, the, yes. right? The strain that remains less effective, less deadly, less harmful. Yes. Um, you don't hear that on the news. <laughs> you exactly. Don't hear, yeah, you don't. You don't hear, you don't hear that. Shouldn't, yeah, it will <laughs> become weaker and weaker. I mean, um, just probabilistically to mutate too much. Yeah, yeah we've never yeah, had a pathogen. If yeah. any pathogen was going to do that, it was going to be the 1918 influenza right. pathogen because it actually mutates really quickly. Yes, it has a and, um, shitty replication. So we had no right. vaccine at the yeah. time. And very sadly, after 50 million deaths, it went away mm -hmm. um, because that's what herd immunity means. I see. And we've had 3 million deaths from SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. um, and we got vaccines so quickly. So this will go away with immunity and we would rather have people vaccinate their way out of this pandemic than get the infection and that's what we're fortunate enough to have 
you know, I wanted to ask your question about one thing, which was, you know, when, when things were getting bad in Michigan, like a week ago, two weeks ago, uh, now I'm looking at it and I'm optimistic that it's, yeah. you know, we're just peaking, maybe turning the corner, hopefully. But when things were getting bad, um, there were all sorts of different things we could have done. Um, we could have diverted a lot of vaccines over there and started doing even ring vaccination, trying to uh, isolate as many contacts as we can and just ring it around anyone around them. Um, and um, we could have reinstituted mandates and, 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 and restrictions, et cetera. And I think they were uh, passionate calls for all these things online. And I think everyone is motivated by the same thing, wanting to do what's best. Um, one thing I want to point out is that some people said that, well, the vaccine takes a month to work. I was like, it don't take no month to work. The reason, the reason it cannot it take a month to work yeah. when the curve, when the cumulative frequency curve split at day 10 and it's, and the, and the outcome is symptomatic infection, which has a latency period. The vaccine is working possibly even from like day two, day three after yes. vaccination. It's gotta be working almost immediately. Yes. It's amazing, yes. but amazing. it's yes. gotta be working yes. that soon. So, okay. The other thing I want to say is that of all these tools in our toolbox, you know, masks are terrific. However, vaccines are another, I mean, the, the order. I don't I, call it a tool. Yeah. I, I don't like the word tool okay. because I call the tools in the toolbox, mass distancing, ventilation, contact tracing and testing. Right. And I call vaccines the solution. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yes, that's, yeah, the, that's the right way. Okay, yeah. So so I was always saying that like, you know, you, you gotta, you know, if, 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 uh, if your house is on fire, you call the fire department, you don't just throw a bucket of water on it. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay, so that's the vaccine, it's you call the, the fire department. Yeah. It's a solution. Okay, but I guess, um, the, the, the second, I mean, I don't know if this is a question, but this is a statement of like what we should have done. But I guess the question is this, um, you know, there are two groups of people. There's the group of people who are watching the situation and making suggestions, perhaps on Twitter, from the comfort of our own second homes, perhaps for some people, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a second home, but. Uh, I have a theory that you have to call it home if you have a second house so that it won't feel so ostentatious. You have to say <laughs> yeah. second home, and second but home. you can't say second house. Yeah, second house, yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> um, but, my, but, but there's also the people living in Michigan and the people living with Michigan, they've had, they have so much, um, I don't know, so much willingness to abide by restrictions. And at some point that cup is empty. It's, it's empty because these are people, these are people like people are, get hungry, people get thirsty. You can't ask somebody to sit in my clinic all day without any food or drink. And at some point people have a craving to see other people. And so the same recommendation for restrictions might have a diminishing effect. So I guess I wonder how you think about this. And we don't talk about this idea that like, you know, you can't ask a person to deprive themselves over and over and over again with indefinite things, nothing to look forward to, no end in sight. Yeah. Um, people will break. And yeah. it's not a fault of the person. No. It's it's who we are. Right? It's, okay. it's, I mean, primates, like we like actually work in groups. And if you take a small primate and you put them alone in a cage, then that primate will die. And that makes me extremely sad when I think about the deprivation that people have had from staying away from each other this year. Yeah. Um, and also primates who don't have like perfectly intact families. And so um, it's, it's no, there's nothing selfish, of course, about wanting to be around other human beings. But the issue was in Michigan, yeah. in my mind, is that there was a threat of schools. And schools are places that have always been safe. And, and the idea of closing schools again um, when they were just managed to open seems so wrong for, for children's mental health and for what children need to learn. And so, yes, putting surging vaccines when we have the ultimate solution to a place seemed like the most obvious, immediate thing to do. And Governor Whitmer called for a surge from the uh, White House. And I, I, don't, I, I don't know if they were surged quickly enough, but um, uh, but that that would have been the immediate thing for me to 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 think about is that you want to search vaccines to a place and actually that is likely you could think of that frankly in terms of india you can think of that for chile you can think of that for brazil like surge now that we have the ultimate solution um surge vaccines to a place and we will be doing that if there are outbreaks of those who are decided not to vaccinate in the future. Yeah. Uh, like you said, ring vaccination, we will, we did that with smallpox, we do that with other illnesses, we will search vaccine. You know, I, 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 I don't know, you know, what, what goes into these decisions, but I think they're probably complex political decisions. And I think maybe one of the things they think about when, if they were hesitant at all to do this, um, is they worry that it will incentivize people to like not do the things they want them to do if they, you know, it, it's almost, uh, I mean, I, I worry that that's what the politicians are thinking sometimes when they were initially hesitant, I think, to send vaccines to Michigan is they think that, 
oh, we'll have to send it to Texas or Florida or something uh, to even perhaps a political opponent. But anyway, I think, I think that was political that they didn't do it right away. And I think that was disappointing because actually a reporter asked me about this and I said, they said, well, why should it go to one state and not the other? And I said, because we're all one nation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just that simple. And yeah. so I would have actually halted somewhere that's going great, which is, um, California, we have very low cases, yeah. very low hospitalizations, halted and temporarily searched in Michigan. Our time's almost up because we always are cutting it close, but I guess I wanted to ask you this question about, um, you know, I, want, I mean, about, about science communication. So, you know, you're a very astute um, infectious disease doctor and expert in all these topics and you communicate on it. Um, and, and you do something that I don't see anyone else do which is you never involve yourself in any bickering ever. <laughs> nobody else is, nobody else can resist, um, myself included. Um, okay, um, is, it, is it tactical? Is it, are you a politician? Is it, um, uh, you're, you're very consistent in what you wanna say. You're deliberative and consistent. How do you think about science communicating? I mean, and, you know, and, and you're in the deep end now because, you know, because I tweet. Because you will, you tweet, you're on, you know, you're, the media wants to talk to you, everyone wants to know your, know your opinion for good reason, because I think you provide an antidote to a lot of poison opinions, I think. I mean, that's my view. Um, uh, so, and, and, so I guess, and, and, and you're <laughs> relatively new to it. I mean, I don't think you yes, can take years old 2020. Right, okay. <laughs> Is when I started tweeting and I will be off. In that's a what you months. promised, but wait, we shall that's see. That's my promise. Okay, but um, <laughs> uh, okay. What is your philosophy of science communication? Um, yes, I actually have a very clean philosophy of science communication, which is that I don't actually am not wedded to any idea, and so if I say something wrong, I will immediately apologize for it if I was incorrect. So I was incorrect um, that the about India that maybe they had reached some level of natural immunity. It was completely incorrect, and when I realized that, I, I just publicly apologized on Twitter. Um, second is that if you just look dispassionately at facts, you don't have to become wedded to anything. So I was really wedded to masks, meaning um, I have written actually, I did count them yesterday. I have written five papers on masks, including one on double masking as more fit infiltration. Mm -hmm. And then, but I'm not, but when I see that the need for masks goes away, then I have to communicate in a data-driven manner and not be wedded to a concept like, people were wedded to condoms for HIV prevention mm -hmm. when PrEP came along. Right. Um, so you have to just follow this data. And then if someone tries to bicker with me, I actually, I, I don't I don't want to because I, I can apologize when I'm wrong. I can be yelled at, fine. I just, I think you can do things like mute and block. <laughs> and that's very helpful. Yes, and Dr. Right. Stefan Baral said, I mute, mute, mute. Then I realized, oh, you can mute. Yes. So as soon as I did that, I feel better. No one's yelling at me. <laughs> Well, I don't think anyone should yell at you. And I think, um, I, I, I mean, it's good of you to say anything that you feel like you you, you, you may have been off or you didn't get the way you wanted. Yeah. But I think the flip side is you were uh, right on 97, 98% of things. <laughs> um, and you were right at a time where the things you were right about was very difficult to be right about. Um, to be right about optimism, to be right about what people need to hear and to be right about I think the core thing you're right about more than anything, that someday when, when history books are written about this period, people will recognize, to be right that we were all, we should have always been thinking about the whole person. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. The, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's not just COVID-19. It's not just COVID. It's their loneliness, it's depression, it's mental state, it's cancer outcomes, it's cardiovascular outcomes, it's HIV yeah. outcomes, it's STD outcomes, it's maternal child health. It's, we, we could have actually done more of it at once. Monica Gandhi, thanks for doing this. Thank you. <laughs> Did you end this on time? Uh